Um, hey, so we're, we're, we're going back to a message that we've kind of started walking through uh, a few months ago, and we're not leaving there today, and we will be here even a little bit longer, and it has to do with the Holy Spirit and His role in our lives and His role in our church, and, and just, um, you know, Jesus' words still startle me today, even though I've read it and even spoken about it at least a dozen times. And Jesus said, he was at the final supper. This would be like last Thursday or Friday, Good Friday time. Jesus is there at the supper, and he's giving a bunch of information. He says something just so hard for me to grasp today. He said, it is better for you that I go away. And I still wrestle with that, that Jesus, the Son of God, told his disciples and you and me today that it is better for us that he left, not just for salvation purposes, but that the Holy Spirit might be poured out on all people, that the same power of God can be present here at New Life Church, can be present in Gladstone, can be present in the people in Russia, and can be present for the refugees that are leaving and heading into Poland, wherever they might be, like the same presence of God can be available, the same power of God can be available for all of us, like Jesus said it was better. He said that he would be our comforter. He would be our advocate. He would fight for us. He would be our helper. He would walk with us through the journey of life, that that there's an empowerment through the Holy Spirit baptism, that that there's different roles of the Holy Spirit. We may be talking about those in the weeks to come, but but today I want to um, highlight this Holy Spirit baptism again and, 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 and just back trail so we can go forward with it. Uh, so let me just rewind a little bit, if you've, like I said, if you've been here a while. Uh, Jesus, Jesus was prophesied, let me say it a different way. John the Baptist, when he was about ready to, get, uh, to baptize Jesus in water, in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, said that Jesus would baptize us in the Holy Spirit. Not me, not an incredible speaker, but Jesus would baptize us in the Holy Spirit. All four Gospels said, look forward to, to that. Some of Jesus' last words in Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5 said, hey, don't leave Jerusalem. Like, don't leave this place until you get empowered from on high. But wait for, here we go, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Don't leave until it happens. There's a power, a powerment, a, a presence that comes on you. Don't leave, don't go forward with the Great Commission until that takes place. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, prophetically speaking, it says, you will receive power. The Greek word there is dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite. It's both explosive power, but there's also another meaning to it. And it's like the idea of water running continuously through like a turbine that generates life-giving power. And so this power is available, both explosive, but also life-giving giving power to live the life that God has called us to live. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. So the same anointing that was on Jesus, the same power of God that Jesus depended on, is the same presence and power of God that's available to you and to me. A dunamis power that enables us and empowers us to live the life that God uh, has for us. So here's a couple of questions. Let me just walk through a couple of these. Was this Holy Spirit baptism, was it just for a season? In other words, if you've been around, maybe you've heard someone say that there was a dispensation, a season, a time frame where gifts were given and poured out. And so for about 100 years, the argument goes, for about 100 years, the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit was given, signs and wonders took place, miracles happened, 
People prayed in other tongues. Holy Spirit baptism happened for about 100 years so that the disciples would be like empowered to be the witness. That it would be the sign that the words that they say are truly God's. And then once the disciples were gone and once, you know, Paul was done and once the Bible was written and then all the power of God left. With all due respect to those that believe that, I believe it is one of the grossest interpretations of Scripture there is. Because it makes light of the necessity of the Holy Spirit's role in our life every day. Not just 2,000 years ago, but I don't know about you. I, I feel I need, man, the power of God demonstrated in my life and through my life every day. I mean, if they needed it 2,000 years ago or 1,900 years ago, how much more do we as a church that's living in almost in a pagan, anti-God culture need to have the power of God working in us and through us? So it, it, it didn't go away at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus said something in John 14, 12. He said, hey, believers will be doing even greater works than I. And we've said before, greater isn't like, you know, greater, like you can't do greater than raise the dead like he did Lazarus, but greater in the sense of the amount of, of, of work that you and I can do being filled and anointed with the Holy Spirit will be greater in portion than Jesus did alone. That's an empowered church. I, I even feel like um, in Luke chapter 11, there's almost this odd verse that comes up. And if you've been part of church world, we take it for granted because we've just read it so many times. But remember in Luke chapter 11, uh, Jesus is talking about prayer. He hasn't really spoken much about the Holy Spirit at all. And the context seems odd. I almost believe that it's written so we would come back to it. But let me just let's follow through with me for a moment. So Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, Jesus is talking about prayer. And here, here's what he says about prayer and, and about the Holy Spirit. It says, which, which of you fathers, if, you, if your son, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake? And our answer is nobody. Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Nobody. If you, then though you are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That's a key phrase because there had not been a lot of conversation about Holy Spirit baptism yet or about Holy Spirit coming on people. This is almost, I believe, a foreshadowing of answering some of the questions that we're faced with today. Like, just curiosity helped me a little bit. How many of you, at one point in your life, someone told you, maybe you're at a church or something, where they said that the gifts are just, they're done away with, or like they're just done? Raise your hand. Be bold. Come on. Come on. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They were done. They're done. They're over. Okay, hands down. How many of you, just take a step further, would say that not only was I taught or learned or whatever that they were done away with, I was actually taught or had been trained that they were almost demonic, like praying in another foreign language or some of the gifts. How many would say, yep, that's, that's kind of how I was trained? Yeah, yeah, quite a few of you. So I believe this question helps to answer that. So there is a, if you have been that background, we all have a bent, right? Meaning that we all read into every situation with some kind of preconceived idea. So even when it comes to Holy Spirit, we have a bent if you grew up in a denomination or a group that never talked about the Holy Spirit, your natural bent is he isn't really necessary. Or if you grew up that in a movement that even said, it's not even for today, you, your bent is it's not for today. Like, so we come into it with a preconceived idea. Would you believe that? A preconceived idea that we have a bent reading into it. I think Jesus really answers and he's reassuring you as believers, hey, listen, if you ask me for more of, if you ask the Father for more of the Holy Spirit in your life, is he going to give you something to damage you? Like Jesus is reassuring you to the person that's here online and you're just nervous 
even about Holy Spirit baptism, about this prayer language, about how the Holy Spirit works. It's like Jesus is speaking to you this morning saying, listen, if you ask my Father for the Holy Spirit, is he going to give you something that's going to damage you? There's supposed to be comfort here in that, that God's going to give you his best. Amen? So I, I think that takes care of, of, of that, really of that question. Um, the second question that maybe we hear a lot about or maybe you've heard is, um, when it comes to Holy Spirit baptism that they were waiting for, isn't that the same baptism that you and I receive when we get saved? Like, when we get saved, don't we receive all of the Holy Spirit that there is? Don't we get everything at that point? And that's a fair question. So let me just answer that with Scripture. So we know in John chapter twenty twenty two. Jesus ascended to heaven, then he, then he came back and he breathed on his disciples and said, hey, receive the Holy Spirit. So we know prior to the day of Pentecost that the disciples had already had the Holy Spirit in them. Jesus had already died. He already breathed the Holy Spirit into them. The Holy Spirit had already been in them. We know that according to 1 Corinthians 6.19, that the moment you become a believer, you're a follower of Christ, you are the temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives in you. We know according to Ephesians 1.13, the moment you get saved, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's not in you, you're not saved. And so... We see in Scripture several times that the Holy Spirit comes in you the moment you get saved, and yet you're going to read in just a moment, and we're going to read in a moment, that there was still something else they were waiting for, an empowerment from the Holy Spirit. He told his disciples, hey, you're already disciples. They're already at the Holy Spirit, and they're, but I want you to wait until you get empowered. We're going to look through the book of Acts and just look again at the consistency of people saying, hey, there's something else that we're looking for, a Holy Spirit baptism. Um, We've talked before that when you get saved, it's like the Holy Spirit, well, not like it is, the Holy Spirit lives in you. So he's in you. When we get baptized in the Holy Spirit and when we pray every day to be filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, like the Holy Spirit has us. Before, like we had the Holy Spirit, he's in us, Now the Holy Spirit has us. We're baptized. We're immersed in his presence. And as the Holy Spirit flows, we flow. That's the life we want to live. Amen? Like we want to flow with the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. We want to be surrounded with the power of God in us and on us, leading us after him. So the question that I want to pose today that we're going to walk through is, as we go through the book of Acts, 30 years of church history, 30 years... um, how did they know if someone was filled with the Holy Spirit or not? Like, how did they know? You'll see in a moment, going to Ephesus or going to, uh, to the Roman centurion, like, how did they know if they had received the Holy Spirit or not? Like, how did they know? I mean, what were they looking for? There was their, were people looking for an awareness of the Holy Spirit's leading? Is that how they knew? You know, they went to some believers in Samaria and said, hey, you're not really following the leading of the Holy Spirit. You got Jesus, but there's something missing. Is, is that how they knew? Were, were they looking for um, a lack of relationship? Like, you know, I, I know you talk about Jesus and faith and getting people saved, but you're not really talking about the Holy Spirit much, and so there's something missing. How did they know if someone had been baptized in the, the Holy Spirit? Was there like missing spiritual power? You know, wouldn't you love that? Hey, Frank, man, (laughs) your spiritual life seems really dead. I know you love Jesus and you're reading your Bible and all, but like there's nothing happening in your life. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Like, I don't know. Like, how did they know? We're going to walk through that. So walk with me again. Um, If you have notes, this is a great place to take notes um, it's just kind of the, the season. We're like in note season. So all you note takers are loving the last couple months. All you non-note takers are like icky. But, oh well. 
Last week was a non-note taker Sunday, right? So, but here we go. I would encourage you to take some notes. So let's look what happened on the first day of Pentecost. The disciples, remember, had already been saved. They had already had the Holy Spirit in them, uh, evidence of believers. Jesus said, wait until you get empowered from on high. The day of Pentecost comes, Acts chapter 2, 1 and 4. What happened? When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. By the way, I have to do a commercial. Um, when we go to Israel, we actually go to where this was at, the, the, the um, upper room, um, and we have two spots left. So there's my commercial. Two spots left. If you want to go to Israel, put it on your connection card. Okay, moving on. So they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So let's just look and see what happened. So, you know, like winds came, what looked like wind. Maybe, is that the sign of Holy Spirit baptism? And so, you know, is that the disciples were looking for in the future? Hey, was there a big wind that took place? Uh, Certainly there was these tongues of fire that rested 120 people there, 120 people, tongues of fire on them, 120 people spoke in a prayer language. Was it these tongues of fire that came on each one? Did they go around saying, have you had a tongue of fire on you yet? No, then you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Was that what it was? Or was it this next thing, hey, they began to pray in other languages, other tongues, (laughs) other languages as the Spirit enabled them? Is that what it was? Let's go on. Let's go on. We know that from that deal that the the fire came on them. There's a blowing wind. They spoke in other languages that they didn't know. And we know that it was the Spirit of God that enabled them to do so. So let's let's go to the next passage. It talks about this Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, In Acts chapter 8, Philip the evangelist, it's a key word, right? Philip the evangelist, he's one of the deacons. He knew the gospel message like He knew how to share faith with somebody. Philip the evangelist is preaching the gospel of Jesus in Samaria, the same place that, remember, Jesus met the woman at the well, the Samaria, the Samaritans. Um, They're getting baptized in water. Word gets um, to the elders in Jerusalem, to the leaders that Peter... And so they sent Peter and John to go to Samaria. Hey, Peter and John, we heard that the, the spirit of, or that Jesus was preached in, in Samaria. Would you go check things out? So they go there, and in Acts chapter 8, here's what we'll pick up. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers. Remember, these are believers, right? So they already had the Holy Spirit in them, according to Galatians and Ephesians and a bunch of passages. Holy Spirit was already in them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So there's something else. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. So they get saved. The, 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 The believers from the elders, the leaders of the church come and they recognize the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them. My question for you and for me is, how did they know the Holy Spirit had not yet come on them? How did they know? Did they say, hey, did, did, did whirls of wind come on you? Like, like, how did they know? They've simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Something interesting happens in the next verse. Simon. Simon was a sorcerer. Maybe he got saved. Maybe he didn't. We're not sure. It sounds like he, sounds like he had some journeying with um, the disciples so Simon is there, and he watches this, and here's what it says. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, what did he do? He offered them money and said, hey, give me this ability so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the text doesn't say what happened. 
when the apostles laid their hands on the Samaritan believers. We only know something happened. And something happened to such an extent that Simon, who was once a sorcerer, offered, which is pretty gutsy, the apostles, the disciples, money so that when he laid his hands on people, the Holy Spirit would come on people too. Can we concede that something probably happened? Right? Something happened. We don't know. I confess that. We, we, we don't know what happened. But we concede something, something happened. Let's go to the next place that we see something happening. Peter is sent to Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion. Uh, his centurion, his whole house are gathered together. They're listening to the message about Jesus. And as Peter is speaking, the Holy Spirit comes on all who are hearing the message. And look what happens. So Peter's sharing the faith about Jesus. He's sharing what happened. Here's what he says. While Peter was still speaking these words about Jesus, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Look at what happened. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished. What were they? They were astonished, surprised. What? Why were they surprised? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been pouring out even on the Gentiles. They weren't surprised that they got saved, right? They weren't surprised necessarily that, that the Holy Spirit was in them. What they were surprised by, something happened that happened to them in Acts 2.4. What happened? They were surprised that the, whole, that, that the gift of the Spirit was given to them. For, how did they know the gift of the Holy Spirit was given? How did they know the Holy Spirit came on them? For, they heard them what? Speaking in tongues. The Greek word there is glossia. Gloss, uh, gloss, gloss, something glossy. Glossalia, glossalia, somebody help me. Glossalia. glossalia. <laughs> that's, how, that's how people learn to pray in their prayer language. You say speak glossalia a bunch of times and before you're there. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So what happened? They received Jesus, they get prayed for, the Holy Spirit comes on them. How did we know that the Holy Spirit came on them? Either it was the fact that they spoke in tongues or that they praised God. I want to suggest to you that they praised God throughout all of history. I want to suggest to you maybe it was the fact that they prayed in, in tongues in another language. Let's go to the next place. Acts chapter 19, uh, this is like 30 years, 25 years after the day of Pentecost. The disciples have been empowered. They're going out and they're reaching people and they're sharing faith with people. Like they get to Ephesus. By the way, I'm just stop here for a moment. Um, I would encourage you to read the book of Acts because the book of Acts tells us when the gospel came to places like Ephesus. Just think about this for a moment. When you read the book of Ephesians, in the book of Acts, you can see the first time the gospel hit Ephesus. Isn't that cool? Or how about the book of Corinthians? You can read the book of Acts and see the very first time that people in Corinth came to Christ. I just think that's fascinating. Maybe you don't. I think it's amazing. But anyway, moving on. So they're in Ephesus. Ephesus begins to hear the gospel message. Um, they found some disciples there. That, you know, they didn't know what was going on. They said, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This is interesting as well. Why is the first question, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Think about that for a moment. Put that back on the screen, would you? They found some disciples. Whatever disciples are, they claimed to be disciples. They said, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's an interesting question, not just did you believe, but moving on. They answered, we have not heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? Like what happened? We had John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to look forward to what was coming after him. That is Jesus on hearing this. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. So they heard the message about Jesus. They were baptized in the name of Jesus. So they had been saved. They were baptized in water. When Paul placed his hands on them, this is a third event, right? Salvation, 
baptism in water, when Paul placed his hands on them, what happened? The Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. There was about 12 in all. This is like 25 years after the day of the book of Acts. Put the screen up, would you? So if you look at the book of Acts, church history, 30 years, there's four different places that seem to allude that something's happening. At least three talk about it, um, maybe more. So Acts 2, 1 through 4, what happened when the Holy Spirit came on, people that had already been saved, tongues happened, and there was wind and fire. I would also submit there was also some boldness that took place as well. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44 and 46, what happened? Tongues happened and praising God happened. In Acts chapter 9, like 25 years after the, book, uh, the, uh, the day of Pentecost, what happened? Tongues happened in prophecy, so they were speaking forth the words of God. In Acts chapter 8, Remember, this is in Samaria. What happened? We don't completely know. If we're honest, we only know that some evidence, something was inferred, something took place. So I just want to suggest to you that one of the signs of baptism in the Holy Spirit might be speaking in tongues and a prayer language. I get that from the fact, if you put that passage up there again, I get from that from the fact that it seemed to be the normative pattern throughout the book of Acts. When someone got the Holy Spirit on them, God gave them a prayer language. Let me just pause for a moment. I'm going to kind of get to the end, but we're going to deal with it in the middle. Um, I know that there are people here that will not agree in Holy Spirit baptism or in praying in a language that I believe everyone can get. I believe that everyone should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I believe everyone has a prayer language you can use, and I believe it based upon how I see Scripture. I'm aware that there are people here that don't believe that. And I just want to let you know that I'm okay with that. That you can still call New Life home. You can even be a member, because here's the point. As a church, we recognize there are some beliefs that we will not at all shrink away from. Like, I will keep believing in Holy Spirit baptism, but there's some things all believers must believe. You must believe Jesus Christ is God, died on a cross, born again on the third day, and our hope for salvation is in him and him alone. That is essential to every believer. Like, you must believe, I, you must believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I, and I say it because if you don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, you have no basis for your faith at all. And so that's something that we will, we will go to the, we will die on. Now, personally, as a church, we will continue to believe that Holy Spirit baptism is available and should be sought by everybody And we will also continue to say that everybody can pray in a prayer language that the Holy Spirit prays through you. Paul says in Corinthians, we'll talk about in a moment, that he prayed in his understanding, in his native language, and he prayed in the Spirit. He's referring to the language, the spiritual language. So in your native language, you pray with your mind. In your spiritual language that's given to you through the Holy Spirit, you pray out of your heart, out of your gut. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But I just want you, can I just suggest to you just relax? So if you're not from this background at all and you're like, I'm just really freaked out, just relax, right? So you can still love Jesus. You can still be a part of our church culture and totally disagree with me on this issue because it's not, it's not a central issue to Christianity. I believe it's an important issue. But those not essential issues. Is that okay? Are we, are we in a good conversation? Amen. Now, you go to some churches that will say, like, if you don't believe X, you shouldn't be a member. Like, that's not what we're saying. So just walk with me. So that was the book of Acts. Um, are there other passages that talk about tongues? Yes. In the Gospels, Jesus' only clear mention of speaking in tongues is found in what we would call a disputed passage in Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 18. It says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. 
In my name, they will drive out demons and they will speak in new tongues and new languages that they didn't have. There's that same word in Greek that I can't seem to say right now. Glossy something. And I recognize that if you look in your Bible, there's going to be a little parathetical comment that's going to say something on the lines of, the earliest manuscripts don't have this. And I'm okay with that because the fact is, is that it was in many of the manuscripts, the book of that gospel of Mark. And everything taught in that few verses of Mark is shown everywhere else in scripture. So I'm okay if that was there or wasn't there. I only know that Justin Martyr, who is responsible for helping to interpret the New Testament that we have, recognized it as a viable part of scripture. So I'm just saying, hey, that was some way being passed around within the first couple of years, first couple hundred years of church history. Now, whether it was in a very original manuscript that Mark wrote and then got passed on, I, I, don't, I don't know. But I love the fact that we're honest and say, hey, the manuscripts that we have, we don't have the very original, but ones that were copied, the earliest ones don't have that passage, and we just want you to know that. And I'm, I'm okay with that. Is there anywhere else that talks about this thing we call tongues? Was it just in, just in the book of Acts? It's funny you should ask. First Corinthians, right? Chapter 12 through chapter 14. Um, have you read First Corinthians 12 through 14 lately? I, I would just suggest to you that you read it. Um, because there is all kinds of spiritual gifts happening in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. All kinds of things happening. As a matter of fact, Paul writes the book to Corinth to help correct some of the things that were happening. So early church, and again, they were meeting together, right? So it said the church met together in a place. They met together, and some were giving prophetic messages, and some were giving tongues, and some were giving interpretations, and, and all these things were happening. And Paul's like, hey, there's so much chaos happening in your church, Corinth, that you got to just kind of limit some things. Can Read it. So much is happening that Paul says, Hey, at the most, two or three come together. So can we, just, can we just confess that while Corinth was struggling with a lot of things, they were not struggling with an awareness of the Holy Spirit working in their midst. Can we confess to that? And can we also just be honest with ourselves? Um, we have a lot further to go to even operate close to how the Corinthian church was operating. Is that, is that okay? Yep. Okay, moving back on. So what is, what are, what's talked about in Corinthians? We're going to do a study later on in, in, in 1 Corinthians, I hope. But 1 Corinthians uh, talks about the fact that there's really two types of tongues. There is, you know, Paul says, now to the matters you wrote about, now to spiritual gifts. So he's talking about the corporate body. He says, hey, there is a Gift of tongues, that's a prophetic gift of tongues. That prophetic gift of tongues needs an interpreter. So Paul says, hey, when you come together and someone gives a prophetic gift of tongues, someone needs to interpret that. Like, that's there. And if you gave the prophetic gift, if no one interprets it, you need to interpret it. But then Paul also says there's another tongues, and it's a personal prayer language. So Paul says this, hey, I pray in tongues more than all of you. And he says, I, you know, but when it comes together corporately, I would rather that you encourage one another. And so, hey, I love the fact that you pray in your prayer language, but when we come together, I would rather that you prophesy that the body of Christ might be built up. So Paul isn't saying, no, nope, this tongue isn't for real. Paul is saying there's two types of tongues. There's a prophetic tongue and a prayer language tongue. Paul says, hey, I pray in my prayer language all the time, but when I come together, like I'm here to edify the body of Christ, and that's going to be done in his native language. Look at Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, just to walk you through that. 1 Corinthians 14, 2 through 3. When I speak in a tongue, I do not speak to other people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14.4, those who speak in a tongue edify themselves. We're going to talk next week, by the way, 
about just the importance of praying in tongues and how it works out. But in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, Paul spoke in tongues often and said, hey, even more than all of you. Um, it's, it's just fascinating. 1 Corinthians 14, 5, Paul says, hey, I wish all of you had a prayer language. I wish all of you would use this prayer language. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 15 through 16, here's what his summary was. Hey, I will pray with my spirit, but I also pray my understanding. I will sing with my spirit. That means that prayer language, because the context he's talking about is prayer language. Sometimes we try to remove and say, no, no, singing in your spirit or praying in your spirit is just allowing the Holy Spirit to lead your prayer. Can I just help you? If the Holy Spirit isn't leading your prayer, you're in trouble. Yeah, right? Like, even in your native language, if the Holy Spirit isn't leading your prayer, we're in trouble. So Paul is saying, hey, I will pray in my understanding with my mind, and I will pray in the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit causes me to pray in in words that I don't understand. I will sing with my understanding, and I will sing in the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit speaks through me. Jude, chapter 20, if you'd put that on the screen, says, But, dear friends, by building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So let me just kind of bring this all back together as you begin to play on the uh, keyboard there. I see from Scripture that there is a pattern Jesus said, wait until you get empowered from on high. They waited. They asked people throughout the book of Acts, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Did the Holy Spirit come on you? Did you receive the Holy Spirit? That was a constant phrase. I see in the book of Acts that in every occasion when the Holy Spirit came on something and something was mentioned, tongues was a part of that. Something that was never there in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, prophecy was there and glorifying God was there and miracles were there. Something happened in the New Testament and it's a prayer language that I believe Scripture says you can receive when you ask the Holy Spirit to just fill you afresh and anew.